Well, hello there, Harvest Glen family and friends. I'm, I'm very excited that you're, you've tuned in online and you're joining us as we continue our, our study, our look through the book of Esther. Uh, today, we're going to be in Esther chapter 3. Um, last week, we, we uh, had a long look at chapters 1 and 2 to see kind of the character of King Xerxes, some of the decisions that he made, and ultimately what God was doing in the lives of of those in power like King Xerxes, but also those like uh, Mordecai and Esther, uh, Jews who were not at the center of power, but God was working in, the, in their lives um, to raise Esther to power so that she would become queen. And really in chapter 3 today, we're going to be getting into uh, kind of the, the great problem um, that is facing the Jewish people. Uh, and it's introduced to us in chapter 3 when we meet uh, another one of the main characters, really the villain of the story. I've entitled the series uh, through our study in Esther, God Behind the Scenes. God is not mentioned explicitly, uh, or even by name in the book of Esther. And so we're often prone to ask, where is God in the book of Esther? What is he doing? How is he working behind the scenes? Ultimately, I believe that many of us are faced with these moments in our lives. Maybe you're in one right now where you're asking, where is God? Uh, life seems uh, chaotic. Life seems um, unfair, unpredictable. Uh, and we're, we're prone to ask these questions um, to God. And we wonder where he is, what he's doing. Uh, we often can't make sense of the things that are happening to us. The psalmist certainly uh, felt this way in Psalm 77. I wanted to read this to us uh, before we begin, the psalmist is, is meditating on his current situation, and he says in Psalm 77, verse 7, he says, Will the Lord spurn forever and never again be favorable? Has his steadfast love forever ceased? Are his promises at an end for all time? Has God forgotten to be gracious? Has he in anger shut up his compassion? But then he pauses. And in verse 11, he says, I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your wonders of old. I will ponder all your work and meditate on your mighty deeds. Your way, O God, is holy. What God is great like our God? He says, you are a God who works wonders, and you have, known, you have made known your might among the peoples. This morning's sermon is entitled, A Call to Remember that in our darkest moments, we need to remember that God has already acted for us on the cross through his son, Jesus. He's already acted for us. He's already delivered us. And he remains with us even in our darkest moments. When we read chapter three, it's a very dark, uh, very dark chapter. Things even at the end of chapter three seem incredibly bleak, incredibly desperate uh, times for the, the Jewish people. We're going to be prone to ask questions like, where is God when Haman put into law a decree to kill all the Jews in the empire? Where is God and would he remain faithful to his people? These are questions we're going to ask and answer in this sermon. I'd like for you to open your Bibles with me to Esther chapter 3. Um, and as you're doing that, um, when you find your way, let me uh, lead us in prayer for a moment. Dear Lord, I, I thank you for the opportunity to preach your word. Um, I pray for those um, who are watching online, who are not able to, to join with us as we're, we're again meeting uh, in person. Lord, I pray that you would comfort them, that you would, would meet all of their needs. Lord, I pray that you would this morning show us the importance of remembering what you have done for us. Remembering, most importantly, what you've done for us through your son Jesus, how you delivered us from the death warrant that was hanging over our heads that we rightfully deserved, Lord. Help us to remember this morning and help us to have hope uh, even in our darkest moments when things seem confusing um, and when really uh, we're having a hard time seeing you, Lord. Help us to remember you. In your name I pray, amen. So we're in chapter three. If you... If you uh, we're in church or you tuned in last week online, you'll remember that chapter two 
included Esther uh, being chosen as the new queen in replace of Queen Vashti. And you'll also remember that chapter 2 ended with Mordecai, who was a, kind of a servant, an administrative servant of the king. He was in and around the palace serving there. Well, he finds out about an assassination attempt um, from two of the king's servants uh, to kill King Xerxes. And what he does is he goes and he, he tells Esther. Esther tells the king in Mordecai's name. And ultimately, it, those men uh, were found out and they were hung on the gallows and all of this was written down in the chronicles and the, the, the records of the king of the empire. But notably, nothing happens to Mordecai. Uh, he's not rewarded. He's not even thanked for saving the king's life. And uh, that's the very last thing that happens in chapter 2. And then in chapter 3, listen with me, read with me in verse 1. It says, after these things... King Xerxes promoted Haman, the Agagite, the son of Hamadatha, and advanced him and set his throne above all the officials who were with him. So here in chapter 3, we're introduced to really the fourth of the four main characters in Esther. You have King Xerxes, you have Esther and Mordecai, who we met in chapter 2, and now we're introduced to the antagonist. We're introduced to really the, the main villain of the book of Esther, and his name is Haman. And instead of Mordecai being promoted for uh, his deeds, for some reason Haman is. Verse 2 says, And all the king's servants who were at the king's gate bowed down and paid, hom and paid homage to Haman, for the king had so commanded concerning him. But Mordecai did not bow down or pay homage. This is really interesting. I want to note that when the king commanded that everyone would bow down to his second in command, would bow down to Haman, this was not worship. This was not the people uh, treating Haman like he was a god. This was simply a sign of, of respect and honor. This was a common practice um, in ancient uh, Near Eastern cultures. Israel, we, we hear uh, times when Israelites would even bow down to a, a, a foreign king, and it wasn't bowing down in worship like we see commanded of, of Daniel in the, in the book of Daniel. But this is just simply a sign of respect. It would be like a, if, if we kind of bowed. It's not really something we do much in our, in our culture, not really an honor-shame culture like that, but that's kind of what's going on here. But for some reason, though it was commanded by the king and everyone's doing this for Haman, uh, Mordecai doesn't. It doesn't even give a reason for why Mordecai doesn't. It just says Mordecai did not bow down or pay homage. And we don't know why. Uh, a lot of people have speculated on Mordecai's reasons for why he doesn't bow to Haman. Um, we can really only guess. I think maybe one of the, the more likely reasons is because Haman is an Agagite. Now that may mean nothing to you, uh, but if you look at verse 1, we're given a little bit of Haman's family tree, just like we were with, uh, with Mordecai when he was introduced in chapter 2. We found that, that he was a Jew. He comes from the line of King Saul. He's a Benjaminite. Well, when Haman is introduced to us in verse 1, it says that he is Haman, the Agagite, the son of Hamadatha. Now, what you need to know about the Agagites is they are kind of descendants of the Amalekites. Now, Israel and Amalek, or the Amalekites, were ancient enemies. I mean, this goes all the way back to some of the earliest days in Israel's history. In Exodus chapter 17, when Israel was being led out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage and slavery, um, when Pharaoh finally gave up and, and let God's people go, and God led them through the Red Sea, he parted the waters and led them through, one of the first thing that first things that happened to Israel on the other side of the Red Sea as they were being led to Mount Sinai to receive the Mosaic law was that they were attacked. The very first people to attack them were the Amalekites in Exodus 17. And in Deuteronomy 25, 17, kind of a reflection as Moses is giving the law a second time to the people uh, reminding them of the law that was given to them at Mount Sinai. He reminds them in Deuteronomy 25, 17, he says, Hey, remember what Amalek did to you on the way as you came out of Egypt. Remember how they came up from behind us and they attacked 
uh, our most weak and vulnerable. That's what Amalek did, was they attacked kind of the tail end of Israel uh, the, as they were leading through, which means that they were attacking um, the weak, the, those who were tired from the journey, the, the, the young and the elderly, probably uh, some of the, a lot of the women. It was a horrible thing to do to a people who were very, very tired considering they were just uh, led out of Egypt. And Moses reminds the Israelites, hey, remember what Amalek did to you and that God is going to get justice on them when you enter into the promised land. So we see that an ancient enemy of the Jews, Haman, a descendant from King Agag, who was one of the Amalekite kings, he has a conflict with King Saul, the predecessor to David in 1 Samuel 15. It's an ancient foe of the Israelites who who is uh, risen to second in command in the Persian Empire. This is a dangerous thing uh, for the Jewish people, to, to have someone who is their enemy achieve that much power. And I believe it's because it's because Haman is an Amalekite that Mordecai refuses to bow to him, refuses to pay respect to him. But when we see that Haman rises to power, one of the questions we ask is, why, why Haman and not Mordecai? This is the first time we hear about Haman. We're not told why he rises to power and, and why Mordecai is not even uh, noticed or thanked. And this is a, a question that happens a lot, that rises to the forefront a lot in the Old Testament, is, is why do the wicked prosper? and the righteous don't? The questions that we ask today, like why do those who don't even want their babies get pregnant and those who who try for years remain barren and fertile? Hey, why at my place of work does my dishonest coworker get promoted over me when I'm doing things all the right way? Why do the wicked prosper? Oftentimes, we just have to admit that life doesn't make sense. For Mordecai, this is not making a lot of sense for him right now. A lot of times life seems very unfair. Life seems chaotic. But in the midst of this, we have to remember um, that ultimately uh, God is in control. We don't have the answers that we want, and we don't need to pretend that we do. Mordecai in all of this couldn't see what God is doing, and we're going to see throughout the book of Esther hey, that, that in not recognizing Mordecai at the moment. God was actually setting something up. He was turning the wheels of of his plan so that at the right time, um, the Jewish people could be saved. Read with me verse 3 through 6. The plot is going to thicken. So Mordecai won't bow to Haman. And the king's servants notice. Verse 3, it says, The king's servants who were at the king's gate said to Mordecai, Why do you transgress the king's command? And when they spoke to him day after day and he would not listen to them, they told Haman in order to see whether Mordecai's words would stand, for he had told them that he was a Jew. And when Haman saw that Mordecai did not bow down or pay homage to him, Haman was filled with fury. But verse 6, it says, He disdained to lay hands on Mordecai alone. So as they had made known to him the people of Mordecai, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews, the people of Mordecai, throughout the whole kingdom of King Xerxes. Now, when you read this, you're like, why would Haman react this way? One guy won't bow down to him, and when he finds out about it, he's so furious. He's like, I'm not just going to have this guy executed for dishonoring me and disobeying the king's command, but I'm going to have all the Jewish people put to death. And we wonder how a thing like that could even happen. Well, that sounds familiar, doesn't it? One can hardly think of, uh, of, of Haman's plan to annihilate all the Jews and not think of uh, another individual. Adolf Hitler and his, his plan, the final solution, right? The Holocaust, where six, over six million Jews were, were killed in extermination camps in Europe. It sounds very similar. Tragedies like this often happen. Attempts at genocide in Rwanda and Cambodia and, and Hitler's final solution. We think about slavery in our own lands. We think about the abortion crisis going on right now. The racial tension, racist, uh, racist sentiments and thoughts. We ask, how can these great evils happen? Well, I think one of the things that, the, that all of these have in common 
is it happens and it, it, we begin to drift into those things as a nation and as a culture when we begin to ignore the Imago Dei. It means the image of God. The fact that every man and woman, boy and girl, young and old, rich or poor, red, yellow, black or white, we were all created by God and in His image. God made us in His image as separate than the rest of creation and as having a certain value and dignity and worth. We all share that. And what what happened in the Holocaust and what happens here with Haman and what happened in slavery and what's happening now in abortion, we're just saying we're twisting what it means to be human, that that these people are subhuman, they're less than human. It's not really a life, it's just a fetus. And we ignore the Imago Dei. And as a result, these great atrocities begin to happen. So this is what Haman decides in verse 6. Look at me in verse 7, what he does. So he decides this is what he's going to do. And in verse 7, it says, In the first month, which is the first month of Nisan, in the twelfth year of King Xerxes, they cast pur, that is, they cast lots, before Haman day after day. And they cast it month after month until the twelfth month, which is the month of Adar. So basically what's going on here is Haman is basically looking to to his gods. He's looking to chance or fate, and he's rolling dice. They call them pur here, and that's going to be important uh, for for the end of the story. But they call them pur, and they're basically lots, or what we would think of as, as dice. And he's rolling them, and they do this day after day. And finally, what the lots fall on is that Haman's lucky day, the day that's going to be decreed, uh, as the day that all Jews will be destroyed throughout the empire is uh, in the twelfth month. So there in the first month, the, the dice rolls and it reveals the twelfth month. So 11 months are going to have to pass between uh, the day that Haman decided that this is what he was going to do and the day that the Jews would be killed. But the lots fell on the twelfth month. What Haman didn't know and what we know as Christians is that only God is sovereign. God is in control over what seems like coincidence or chance or fate or, or luck. Proverbs 16.33 says, The lot is cast into the lap, but its every decision is from the Lord. Now, that, I don't think that Proverbs is encouraging us to make all our decisions by flipping a coin or rolling some dice. Uh, that text is not encouraging superstition. It's actually encouraging trust that what seems like chance and what seems like fate and what seems like like coincidence in your life is actually the Lord's hand at work. We should trust him that he's in control. And God was certainly in control of the date um, that Haman rolled. So Haman goes to King Xerxes now in verse 8. Read with me. It says, Then Haman said to King Xerxes, There is a certain people scattered abroad and dispersed among the peoples in all the provinces of your kingdom. Their laws are different from those of every other people, and they do not keep the king's laws. So it is not in the king's profit to tolerate them. If it please the king, let it be decreed that they be destroyed, and I will pay 10,000 talents of silver into the hands of those who have charge of the king's business, that they may put it into the king's treasuries. So the king gave, uh, took his signet ring from his hand and gave it to Haman, the Agagite, the son of Hamadatha, the enemy of the Jews. And the king said to Haman, the money is given to you and the people also do with them as it seems good to you. I want to point out that notice how how tricky Haman is when he goes to the king. He's so vague when he's talking about these people. He just says there's a certain people scattered abroad. He doesn't even tell them that these are the Israelites, these are the Jews. He's so vague and he's also deceptive. He tells them that there's a certain people scattered and dispersed among your kingdom, and that's true. Then he says their laws are different from those of every other people. Well, there is some truth to that, but it's also kind of a half-truth. They're not completely different, but notice he moves from a truth to a half-truth to a lie. He says they do not keep the king's laws, so it's not in your profit to tolerate them. That's an outright lie. The Jews were, were good citizens. They were not guilty of transgressing the king's laws. But Haman really manipulates the king and deceives him and is so vague. 
Haman thought that he could buy God's people. He offered 10,000 talents to buy the people of God. I think about John chapter 10, verse 27 through 29. It's the, the passage about how Jesus is the good shepherd. And he says this, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. Haman thought that he could buy God's people. Xerxes thought that he could just hand them over to Haman. But ultimately, what we're going to see is that no one can buy or sell or barter with God's people. We fit snugly and securely in the palm of God's hand, and Jesus makes clear that no one is able to snatch us out of his hand. The Father has given us over to Jesus, and we're safe and secure there. The king says in, in verse um, 11, he says, The money is given to you, and the people also do with them as it seems good to you. Haman here is really portrayed as unrestrained evil. He's second in command only to the king, and what the king does here is he takes off his signet ring, and he gives it to Haman. So anything Haman does with that, it's like it's from the king himself. Haman has ultimate power, ultimate authority in the Persian Empire. But we need to remember that even when it looks like uh, Haman is unrestrained evil, there's really no such thing. There's no such thing as unrestrained evil. Remember that in the book of Job, when Satan came before God and, and wanted to do these awful things to Job so that he could get Job uh, to speak against God and to, and to curse God, God has to give Satan permission for Satan to afflict Job with all these sufferings. You see, we belong to our king who has paid the ransom price for us. And remember, Christian, in your dark hours, Remember that nothing can come against you unless the Father gives consent. In His will, sometimes He allows things to come against us that are, are extremely uh, painful. We, we, will, uh, we will not understand why. We'll be prone to ask God, why? Why are you allowing this to happen to me? But remember, He has a plan for your life. He's working in ways that you can't see right now. And so we're getting to the end here. Haman is given the signet ring and he, he goes to draft this decree of destruction on the Jews. Read with me verse 12. It says, Then the king's scribes were summoned on the 13th day of the first month, and an edict according to all that Haman, comm Haman commanded was written to the king's satraps and to the governors all over the provinces and to the officials of all the peoples to every province in its own script and every people in its own language. It was written in the name of King Xerxes and sealed with the king's signet ring. Letters were sent by couriers to all the king's provinces with instruction to destroy, to kill, and to annihilate all Jews, young and old, women and children, in one day, the 13th of the 12th month, which is the month of Adar, and to plunder their goods. A copy of the document was to be issued as a decree in every province by proclamation to all the peoples to be ready for that day. The couriers went out hurriedly by order of the king, and the decree was issued in Susa of the citadel. And the king and Haman sat down to drink, but the city of Susa was thrown into confusion. So what we see here is in verse 12, uh, Haman gets his decree with the king's signet ring drafted. This decree of destruction for the Jews goes out. And we, we would miss it in case we had some background information. But in verse 12, it says that the king's scribes were summoned on the 13th day of the first month. So think about it, you know, like January 13th comes and the decree is written. And it's, and it's basically saying that on the 13th of December all the Jews are going to be killed. But what's interesting about the 13th day of the first month is that for the Jewish people, uh, this was the day before the Passover. This decree signaling their destruction and their imminent 
uh, death, this death warrant that was going to hang over them for a year, ensuring their demise, came to them on the eve of the Passover. Now, if you remember, the Passover was of central importance for the Jewish people. It caused them to remember what God had done for them in the Exodus events. That the final plague, the death of the firstborn, that that God provided a Passover lamb for them, that if they slaughtered it and covered their doorposts with its blood, they would be passed over, they would be spared. And God really used that to lead them out of slavery, out of the house of Egypt. And so what they did year after year, for hundreds and hundreds of years without fail, was that they celebrated the Passover. They would slaughter the Passover lamb and have the Passover meal to remember what God had done for them in saving them as a people from Egypt. And so as they're getting ready, they're making preparations for Passover, they're getting ready to slaughter the lambs, they find out out of nowhere, they're blindsided with the decree that they're all going to die in 11 months. How could they celebrate God's deliverance when their destruction was coming? Imagine that someone gave you horrible news on Christmas Eve or the night before you're supposed to go to Easter service. Think for a moment, how would that affect your worship? How would that affect your ability to remember what God has done for you? The reality is we are all living in difficult times coronavirus, the protests, the things that you and I face on a day-to-day level, we're lying if we're we're telling ourselves that it's not affecting our worship. It most assuredly is. But we can have hope in the midst of it. We need to remember who God is and what He's done. Surely, for those, uh, those Jews who are getting ready to celebrate the Passover, remember they're living as exiles. It was because of their sin that God had brought judgment on them and had sent them into exile in a land that was not their own. So they're getting ready to celebrate the Passover in in exile for another year. And then this comes. I can imagine that for a lot of the Jews, they probably thought that this was it, that God had finally had enough with them, that he was just getting ready to, to destroy them and wipe them out for good. This was really going to challenge their faith on whether their God was going to keep his promises and whether they were going to see him deliver them again. Could he do it again? This would be the question on their minds. It's in times like like these, times that we're experiencing now, that we need to remember who God is and what he's done for us. You see, when we read chapter 3 and everything that Haman does in this chapter, this unspeakable evil that he's planned against the Jews, I mean, all of it started because one man wouldn't bow to him. His ego could not stand it. And he was filled with so much fury, he decided to commit mass genocide on an entire people group in the Persian Empire. The Jews, when we leave off in chapter 3 today, they had an undeserved death warrant hanging over their heads. Mordecai wouldn't bow. But Haman's reaction was completely overblown, a complete overreaction. But I want to make a connection here. See, you and I, we also had a death warrant hanging over our heads. But unlike the Jewish people, um, it was completely and utterly deserved on our part. You and I sinned. We fell into sin. Our first parents, Adam and Eve, they ate of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, which which God had commanded them not to eat of. And mankind fell into a sin, and you and I and every human that's been born from Adam was born with a sinful nature. We're born as rebels against God. We don't want Him. We want to disobey. Our hearts are inclined to evil. We don't want His kingdom to come. We don't want his will to be done. We want ours to be done. And as a consequence, there was a death warrant hanging over us, a record of our debt, a record of every wrong. And because of it, we were headed for an eternity separated from God in a place called hell. And maybe for some people, when they hear the story of Adam and Eve and 
realize the, the state that we're in outside of Christ, the state of our relationship with God. Maybe some people would, would see God's uh, response to sin as, you know, an overreaction or overly harsh. And I want to encourage us that we never see God's response to sin as overly harsh or an overreaction. It makes me think uh, about a, a video that I saw a while back. And it was a video, uh, there was a Christian conference going on, and they had a panel uh, of pastors and Christian leaders at the front, and they were having a Q&A se session, the crowd and the panel. And someone from the crowd uh, asked the panel this question. They said, since God is slow to anger and patient, then why, when man first sinned, was his wrath and punishment so severe and long-lasting? That was the question that was posed to the panel. And one of my heroes, his name's R.C. Sproul, he's, he's passed away now. He's, he responded this way to the question. He said, time out. And he paused for a second and he said, this creature from the dirt defied the everlasting holy God. God had said, the day that you shall eat of it, you shall surely die. And instead of dying that day, he lived another day and was clothed in his nakedness by pure grace and had the consequences of a curse applied for quite some time. But the worst curse would come upon the one who seduced him, whose head would be crushed by the seed of the woman, by Jesus. And the punishment was too severe? And he said, what's wrong with you people? He said, I'm serious. I mean, this is what's wrong with the Christian church today. We don't know who God is, and we don't know who we are. The question is, why wasn't it infinitely more severe? He said, if we have any understanding of our sin and who God is, that's the question, isn't it? And I think R.C. Sproul was, was dead on in that response. You see, as long as you and I see our sin as, as really no big deal, we'll never understand the cross of Christ, why Jesus had to come and be made flesh and live in a perfectly obedient life and then be crushed by the Father as our substitute. We'll never understand the horrific brutality, the gruesome nature of the cross. We'll never understand what Jesus had to endure for our sakes if we insist on seeing our sin as a small problem, it's no big deal. You see, we would not give God the honor that was due his name. We wouldn't bow our knee as rebels. We didn't want to, and we deserved hell. But Jesus took the punishment that we deserved, and he took away the death warrant by receiving the punishment himself. And he nailed our record of debt to the cross. That's what he's done for us, believers. This is what we need to remember. Just as the Jewish people, they, they were going to be tested. Are we still going to celebrate the Passover? Are we going to remember what God has done for us in the face of something that looks so hopeless? We as Christians need to remember that our Passover lamb was slaughtered for our sake. And because of that, the death warrant has been taken away and you and I will never, ever be alone, even in our darkest moments. I want to encourage you, if you are not a believer today, that that, that death warrant still hangs over you and you need to repent and believe in Jesus and find forgiveness of your sins and life everlasting. As we conclude our sermon today, look with me in verse 15 says the decree was issued in Susa and it went out through the empire. And the last thing we read in chapter 3 is this. It says the king and Haman sat down to drink, but the city of Susa was thrown into confusion. You see, when we read chapter 3 on its own, it really resists us rushing to the good news. It ends in confusion and, tor and turmoil. And turmoil. You see, verse 15, I think, is, is a really appropriate picture of life on earth sometimes. Those in power are clinking their glasses and uh, chilling out in their high places while 
those of us down here are kind of left to deal with the fallout of their decisions. But verse 15 is just that. It's just a picture of life on earth. You see, in Psalm 2, we get a better picture, a picture of that realm we cannot see, of true uh, reality. In Psalm 2, it begins like this. The psalmist says, Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. But then he says this in in verse 4. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. This is what we need to remember, church, that despite those in power like Xerxes and like Haman who who may plot and scheme. And despite times when it feels like God is not there, that he's not with us, we need to remember that God has acted for us. He set his king on Zion. That king paid the price for our sins. He rose from the dead. He's ascended into heaven and he reigns and he's with us. Let's be faithful to remember today what God has done for us so that we can have hope in the here and now. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I I thank you so much for the opportunity to preach your word. Lord, would would you use this? Would you help us to remember the importance of remembering what you've done for us? Lord, you were slain and you received the punishment that we deserved when all hope was lost for us, when we were enemies of you, hell-bound and hopeless, you rescued us. You placed us in the palm of your hand, and nothing can snatch us from your hand. Thank you, Jesus. Help us to respond in faith today. It's in your name I pray. Amen.